Hey everybody, in this video I'm going to go through a bunch of differential equations, exam two review problems and solutions, though these types of problems could be on your differential equations exam one. These include problems involving the method of undetermined coefficients, the method of integrating factors, phase lines, bifurcations, some basic models with mixing problems and harmonic oscillators, masses on springs, as well as some problems dealing with the basic ideas of a phase plane. So let's go ahead and get started. The very first problem is a problem where I say use the method of undetermined coefficients to solve this first order linear differential equation that is also non-homogeneous because of the 3e e to the 2t power here. If you rewrite this differential equation in what's called linear operator form by adding 4y to both sides, it will be dy dt plus 4y equals 3e e to the 2t. And this is non-homogeneous because the right hand side of this is non-zero. It's 3e e to the 2t. To solve this with the method of undetermined coefficients, the first step is to consider the associated or corresponding uh, homogeneous equation where you make the right-hand side zero. It's a different differential equation, but its general solution by some theory involved in a proof we'll do later does allow us to justify considering it to help us find the general solution of the equation we're interested in. So just make the left-hand side the same, dy dt plus 4y, and make the right-hand side zero. That's the corresponding homogeneous equation. What's its, its general solution? If you rewrite it by subtracting negative 4y from both sides, you can make it look like that. And you can either use separation of variables or guessing to find the answer of this. You're looking for a function whose derivative for all values of t is equal to negative 4 times itself. A little bit of thought reveals that e to the negative 4t works, and also an arbitrary constant times e to the negative 4t. The general solution of this associated homogeneous equation, I'm going to call y sub h for homogeneous, is an arbitrary constant c times e to the negative 4t. Okay? That'll be part of the general solution of the original, the original non-homogeneous equation. How do you find a particular solution? That's the next step. We're looking for a function whose derivative plus 4 times itself is 3e e to the 2t for all t. Certainly bad guesses would be cosines or sines. Good guesses would involve e to the 2t. We don't know what the coefficient will be. I'll call it a. But a times t e to the 2t power would be a good guess. Whereas this c is arbitrary, this a must be something particular. It's the undetermined coefficient that I must find. I'm hoping it works. There's actually not an ironclad guarantee unless you've been experienced with this enough. What is its derivative? Use the chain rule, get an extra factor of 2. You get 2a e to the 2t. Plug that into the left-hand side of the linear operator form of the differential equation. Left-hand side becomes yp prime plus 4yp. yp prime is 2a e to the 2t and 4yp is 4a e to the 2t. Those are like terms that can be combined to 6a e to the 2t. And now I want to set this equal to the right hand side, set this equal to 3e e to the 2t, and I'm asking is there any value of the constant a that will make these the same function, equal for all values of t? And certainly the only way that's going to happen is if the 6a coefficient here matches the 3 coefficient there. 6a must equal 3, therefore a is 3 divided by 6, which is 1 half. Therefore, now the theory, which we're going to prove later on, is that we take the general solution of the associated homogeneous equation and add our particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation with a equal to 1 half to get our general solution of the non-homogeneous equation. y is c times e to the negative 4t, that's the yh, plus yp, this thing, with a equal to 1 half. 1 half e to the 2t, that is yp. But I am after the solution of an initial value problem. Don't forget about the initial condition. y of 0 is going to equal negative 2, so I can take that information, plug in t equals 0 and y equals negative 2, uh, I forgot a t here in noticing. c times e to the 0 is c. 1 half times e to the 0 is 1 half. Subtract 1 half from both sides. 
and I get C is negative two and a half, which is negative five halves. Putting that in there gives us our final answer. Combine the general solution with that value of C. Y equals negative five halves e to the negative 4t plus 1 half e to the positive 2t. There's our answer. It's worthwhile to check, not only to make sure you did it right, but also just for conceptual understanding. Let's check the initial condition first. We want y of 0 to be negative 2. When we plug in t equals 0, e to the 0 is 1. We get negative 5 halves plus 1 half, and that indeed is negative 2. It's negative 4 halves, which is negative 2. How about the differential equation? Let's actually check it in the original form back up there. Back up there, the left-hand side is dy dt. Take the derivative of this thing right there. Bring down the negative 4 here. I get negative 4 times negative 5 halves e to the negative 4t. Bring down the 2 right there. I get 2 times 1 half e to the 2t. I'm using the chain rule a couple times there. Negative 4 times negative 5 halves simplifies to positive 10 and 2 times 1 half simplifies to positive 1. That's what the left-hand side of the original differential equation simplifies to. We're not done. Does the right-hand side simplify to the same thing? Negative 4y plus 3e to the 2t. Replace y with this function. Simplify, do we get the same thing? I'll just do it partially in my head here. Negative 4 times negative 5 halves. Hey, we did that before. That's positive 10 e to the negative 4t. Then we have negative 4 times 1 half e to the 2t. That's minus 2 e to the 2t. Then don't forget about your plus 3 e to the 2t. Yeah, that's going to simplify to the exact same thing. 10 e to the negative 4t plus e to the 2t. We've got a match here and here. Those match. Confirming, once again, that this thing right here is the final answer. On to the next problem. This one says using the method of integrating factors to solve this differential equation. This is also a linear non-homogeneous equation. Non-homogeneous because of the t cubed. It's linear in y. This non-linearities in the t don't matter. This is still a linear differential equation. We also have an initial condition. If it was not written in this form to begin with, if the one, well, one over t plus four times y was on the other side, we'd want to bring it over to this side before we use the method of integrating factors. Because what is the me method of integrating factors? It says that the, the integrating factor, called mu, is e to the integral of whatever function is in front of the y here. That's the way the method of integrating factors goes. I'm not going to explain why it works. We figure out the integrating factor, then we multiply both sides of the differential equation by the integrating factor, and what happens, almost as if by magic, is the left-hand side becomes easy to integrate, and the right-hand side is not too bad either, in this case. Integral of 1 over t plus 4 is going to be natural log of the absolute value of t plus 4, but you don't need to bother with the absolute value signs. You don't need to bother with the plus c either. You can effectively take c to be 0. <laughs> Then this does simplify. e to the x and natural log of x are inverse functions. This simplifies to t plus 4. That is the integrating factor. So now I take the differential equation and multiply both sides by it. Multiply both on the left and the right. On the left, t plus 4 times dy dt is part of the left, new left-hand side. And then with this term, the t plus 4 is cancel, leaving you with just plus y. Don't forget to do it on the right. That's a common mistake, is to forget to multiply by the integrating factor on the right. There we have it. We can also expand this out to t to the fourth plus 4t cubed. And then we want to integrate both sides with respect to t. y is a function of t here. Don't integrate y with respect to t and think that you get y times t. y is a function of t. But the thing that's magical about it is this expression inside the integral on the left always ends up being, if you've done it right, the derivative with respect to t of the integrating factor, t plus 4 in this case, times the unknown function that you're trying to solve for. That always happens if you've done it right. So you're really integrating a derivative. Therefore, you get the function that's inside there, because the integral and derivative cancel each other out. So this becomes t plus 4 times y 
you still do need to do the integral on the right-hand side and also include an arbitrary constant. Integral of t to the fourth is one-fifth t to the fifth. Integral of four t cubed is t to the fourth. Don't forget your integration constant c. Now divide both sides by t plus four to solve for y. And this gives us a general solution that can be written as one-fifth t to the fifth plus t to the fourth plus c all over t plus four. If I don't like that fraction of one-fifth in the top, I can multiply both the top and the bottom by five and write it as t to the fifth plus five t to the fourth plus five c, which you could just call another constant c and also multiply it in the bottom to get 5t plus 20. Doesn't matter. This is fine. Let's now use the initial condition, y of 0 equals 2, to say that when y is 2 and t is 0, we get this equation, and that allows us to solve for c. Multiply both sides by 4, and you will get that c is 8. And therefore, we can write the final answer as y equals 1 -fifth t to the fifth plus t to the fourth plus eight all over t plus four. And here, yes, I can also multiply the top and the bottom of this by five and also write it as t to the fifth plus five t to the fourth plus 40, eight times five, all over five t plus 20. Those functions are the same thing. If I've not made a mistake, this will be the final answer. Um, I hope it's right. If it's not, I'll put a little note. I don't want to take the time to check it because that'll just take too much time, but it certainly can be done. Okay, on to the next page. And the next page involves qualitative ideas, phase lines, and bifurcations. Number three here, I'm giving, given the sketch of a right-hand side f of y of a differential equation dy dt equals f of y. That's called an autonomous differential equation when the right-hand side only depends on a y and not t. Yeah, careful. This graph is the graph of a function of y. Okay? This is not a solution of the differential equation. It helps you figure out the nature of solutions. That's what it does. We could draw a um, slope field, if we liked. And that might not be a bad idea, just to get the idea of what's going on here. Um, but we're not after a slope field, we're after a phase line, which compresses all the information in the, in the slope field onto a vertical y-axis. In the slope field itself, you're drawing solutions. The phase line just focuses on the y-coordinates of solutions as time passes. Um, so how do you do that? First, identify the equilibrium solutions. That's where this right-hand side function, f of y equals 0, which is negative 1, 0, positive 1, and positive 2. So there are four equilibrium solutions, y equals 2, y equals 1, y equals 0, and y equals negative 1. Those horizontal lines, constant functions, are solutions of this autonomous differential equation. And in fact, the slope field is horizontal along those lines. What if y is bigger than 2? Is, are the slope marks in the slope field positive or negative in the slope? You need to look at the sign of the f of y function because that equals the slopes of solutions. It's negative when y is bigger than 2, so you will have solutions with negative slopes up here, and they will look about like this. When y is between 1 and 2, the outputs of this function are positive. Your slopes will have positive slopes, and solutions will look like this and there'll be horizontal translations of each other for an autonomous equation. When y is between 0 and 1, we get solutions that are have negative slopes, so you, they will look like this. When y is between negative 1 and 0, positive output values here, you get positive slopes in the slope field. And when y is less than negative 1, it did not change sign. We still have positive slopes in here, and solutions look like this. For the phase line, we take all this information and compress it onto just a single y-axis. And the equilibrium solutions become equilibrium points at 2, at 1, at 0, and at negative 1. If solutions are increasing, you put upward pointing arrows. So if y is less than negative 1, these solutions are increasing. You've got to put an upward pointing arrow indicating that y is increasing over time. In here, solutions are still increasing between negative 1 and 0. Then they alternate 
They're decreasing when y is between 0 and 1. They're increasing when y is between 1 and 2. And they're decreasing when y is above 2. That makes this point a sink, <clears throat> this point a source, this point a sink, and this point call, is called a node. Sinks have arrows that point toward them, nearby arrows. Sources have nearby arrows that point away. Sink, source, here's another sink. Here, this is a node. Arrows are pointing away from it when you're slightly above it and towards it when you're slightly below it. If it was the opposite, where they're pointing downwards on both sides, that would still also be a node. Notice that in terms of what's called the linearization theorem, we can tell that this one is a sink because the derivative of the f of y function is negative there. f prime of positive 2 is negative. That does imply that this is a sink if you know the thing called the linearization theorem. f prime of 0 is also negative. That implies this one is a sink. The slope of the tangent line to this graph is negative. At these two points, however, you, the linearization theorem actually does not apply because the slope of the tangent line is actually zero at both spots, and you have to look at the sine, positive or, neg or negative, of the function on either side of those equilibrium points. Positive on both sides here at negative one, so you have upward pointing arrows here and here. It does change sign here from negative to positive. Even though the slope is zero, this still acts like a source because the right-hand side function changes from negative to positive, again, even though the slope is zero there. Okay, so the linearization theorem does not apply to all these equilibrium points. You have to look at the sine of the f of y function near the equilibrium points. Problem four, consider the one parameter family of first order autonomous ODEs dy dt equals f sub mu of y which equals y squared plus 6y plus mu. All right, mu is considered to be a constant when you think about this differential equation um, as a differential equation where a phase line could be, could be drawn. However, with bifurcation theory, we're interested in what happens to these phase lines as the parameter mu changes. So even though I say mu is constant when you're thinking about an individual differential equation, we're ultimately interested in asking what happens as that constant changes, which sounds oxymoronic, but that is what we're trying to do. We're looking for a bifurcation value of this family, a value of the parameter mu where a big change occurs that if you draw something called a bifurcation diagram can look like a fork and that's why it's called a bifurcation. The furcation represents a forking. Sure your worker explain. Also draw the phase line from mu slightly less than, equal to, and slightly greater than the bifurcation value. Make sure you draw arrows appropriately, label equilibrium points as sinks, sources, or nodes. Okay? When your right-hand side function for an autonomous equation like this is quadratic in y, the quickest way to solve this is with the quadratic formula. For the equilibrium points, which correspond to equilibrium solutions, we want to set the right-hand side equal to zero. We set y squared plus 6y plus mu equal to 0 and solve for y, it will depend on mu. And it's that dependence on mu that will help us figure out the bifurcation value. I use the quadratic formula to solve this. Since you don't know mu, you can't really factor it, so you have to use the quadratic formula. y will be negative of this coefficient, negative 6 plus or minus square root of 6 squared is 36 minus 4 times the coefficient of y squared is 1 times the constant term, which is mu, all over 2 times 1. This becomes negative 3 plus or minus 1 half times the square root of 36 minus 4 mu. You also could factor out a 4 out of the um, term under the square root, and then the square root of 4 is 2, canceling the 2s. I also could write this as negative 3 plus or minus square root of 9 minus mu. Either way you do it, it's when the thing under the square root equals zero, that's going to be the bifurcation value. And that pretty clearly you can see is going to be at mu equals nine. The bifurcation value is at mu equals nine. That's where the big change occurs, where the forking occurs. Now it's not clear whether the forking, so to speak, is in which direction it is. We have to think about really the graph, this right-hand side function. When mu is bigger than 9, mu corresponds to a vertical shift in the graph. 
Evidently, the graph is high enough and opening upwards because the coefficient of y squared is positive that um, it's probably going to look something like, uh, like this if you are careful and draw it on your calculator. That's when mu is bigger than 9. When mu equals 9, evidently we've got one real root, and the graph is just going to touch the horizontal axis, which I'm labeling y, at one point. Sorry about that. And when mu is less than 9, the graph is going to have two roots. So as mu increases, from less than 9 to 9 to greater than 9, we go from having two equilibrium points to one to none. The change from 2 to 0 effectively happens at the one value mu 9, where there's one equilibrium point. So for the phase lines, when mu is less than 9, we've got two equilibrium points. y is horizontal here, y is vertical here. Those two equilibrium points are negative. I could draw them down here pretending that zero is up here, say. It's not a big deal. You can think about linearization. You've got a positive slope there. This one's going to be a source. This one's got a negative slope there. You can think about that. This one's going to be a sink. You also can think about the sign of the output of this function, whether it's positive or negative. When mu equals 9, those two equilibrium points effectively come together in a node and the arrows above and below are consistent. These are upward pointing arrows. The right-hand side function is always greater than or equal to zero in value, so the solutions of the differential equation have to always be increasing, so your uh, phase line arrows are pointing upward. And then when mu is bigger than 9, there are no equilibrium points. The graph is always above the horizontal y-axis here in this picture, so solutions are always going to be increasing. Okay? That's what I'm looking for. You can try to add more to this picture, you could try to make this a full bifurcation diagram, so to speak, and maybe make a curve of equilibria here, but it's not necessary based on the way this problem is phrased. All right, I did everything in the problem. On to the next page. Oh, kind of a long problem here. Take it step by step. Consider the following first order system, two equations of linear ordinary differential equations. It is what's called partially decoupled because the dy dt equation doesn't involve any x's at all. I can pretty quickly see, by guessing, that the general solution of this equation is going to be some arbitrary constant times e to the 4t. I'm looking for a function, the most general function, whose derivative is always 4 times itself. Typically, you'd call that constant c, but notice here I'm calling the constant k2. There's a reason for that. k2 e to the 4t is a general solution of the second equation, which again, since it doesn't involve x at all, it is decoupled from this equation. I can think about this one separately. But now I need to think about the first equation. If I'm going to think about the system, I need to substitute this expression, this function, in place of y to get this new differential equation for x. That no longer involves y explicitly because I have plugged in the function in place of y, but it is a first order, linear, non-homogeneous differential equation, which again I can use either the method of undetermined coefficients for or integrating factors. Let's do it with integrating factors. I think that's something that's always worth practicing a little bit more. You want to subtract 2x from both sides to help you more clearly see what the integrating factor will be. I want to find the integrating factor to be e to the integral of whatever the function in front of x is. In this case, that's negative 2 dt. That'll be e to the negative 2t plus c, but I can take the c to be 0. This function, e to the negative 2t, is now my integrating factor. I Just like before, I, well, I multiply both sides of this equation by the integrating factor. And once again, the magic happens that when you've done it right, the left-hand side becomes easy to integrate because it becomes the derivative by the product rule of the integrating factor times the unknown function. x is a function of t here. Keep that in mind. Don't forget to multiply the integrating factor times the right side as well. That's, again, a common mistake. e to the 4t times e to the negative 2t is e to the 2t. This is the derivative with respect to t of the integrating factor times the unknown solution function, which, again, even though I'm just writing it as x, is a function of t. You can check that with the product rule. 
That's the first function times the der derivative of the second in this product. And this one here, there's the second function, x times the derivative of the first. The derivative of e to the negative 2t is negative 2 e to the negative 2t. So now when I integrate it, integrating this becomes easy. I'm integrating a derivative, so I just get the function itself, e to the negative 2t times x. I need to integrate the right-hand side, and don't forget your arbitrary constant. 3k2 e to the 2t, if I integrate that, I'll get 3 halves k2 e to the 2t. You can double check that by differentiation. Plus an arbitrary constant, which I could call c, but I think I'll call it, how about k1? Okay, don't forget to solve for x by multiplying both sides by e to the positive 2t. You'll get x is uh, positive 3 halves k2 e to the positive 4t plus k1 e to the positive 2t. So, did we do part A? We wanted to find, use the method of undetermined coefficients or integrating factors to find a formula for x of t involving two arbitrary constant, k, constant k1 and k2. And our solution in vector form will be this. Let's go ahead and write that down. Combine the general solution for x with the general solution for y. Call it vector capital Y of t. and just substitute. Go ahead and make that replacement. 3 halves k2 e to the 4t plus k1 e to the positive 2t. Maybe you prefer writing that in the opposite order, but it doesn't matter. And little y of t is k2 e to the positive 4t. There is what you could call a general solution, a general solution of the original system, back up here, the system in vector form. I could also consider each scalar function individually and verify that the left-hand side equals right-hand side in both cases. But we also want to find the unique solution of what I call a generic initial value problem. I didn't pick particular numbers for x of 0 and y of 0. I picked arbitrary numbers, but I'm pretending that they are fixed, okay, and I want to solve for k1 and k2 in terms of x0 and y0, those fixed constants. k1 and k2 are arbitrary constants. It doesn't matter what they are. This still solves the system. x0 and y0 are fixed constants. I can solve for k1 and k2 in terms of x0 and y0. And that will give me a unique solution to an initial value problem. Replace t with 0. And let me go ahead and rearrange the right side there. k1 plus 3 halves k2. And then the second component is just going to be a k2. Pretty clearly, k2 is going to equal y0, but k1 will not equal x0. k2 equals y0, then x0 will be this, and go ahead and replace k2 with y0 to get um, k1 plus 3 halves y0. Solve that for k1. k1 will be x0 minus 3 halves y0. Hopefully I have not made a mistake. And that means the final answer for the unique solution of the generic initial value problem, y of t. Go back up here, replace k1 with this entire thing, replace k2 with y0. So I think I'll rearrange k1 times e to the 2t will be x0 minus 3 halves y0 times e to the negative e to the 2t plus 3 halves k2 e to the 4t becomes 3 halves um, y0 e to the 4t. 3 halves y0 e to the 4t. And then k2 e to the 4t becomes y0 e to the 4t. So again, I'm thinking of x0 and y0 is fixed, and then that means this is one particular function, a unique solution of the generic initial value problem. All right, a modeling problem, mass on a spring, it looks like. Block of mass, 5 kilograms, weighs 49 newtons. Um, that means the force it exerts on the ground when it's sitting on the ground is 49 newtons. I need to multiply the mass times the acceleration due to gravity to get the force in newtons. Suppose it stretches a vertical spring. <clears throat> hanging, okay, we're going to attach this mass to a spring, 
that's hanging to a ceiling or something. It displaces it, it stretches it by 0.1 meters when it is attached. I'm telling you that means the spring constant, K, is 49 newtons divided by 0.1 meters, which is 490 newtons per meter. Theoretically, you should be able to figure that out as well. Because the force um, due to the, to the spring turns out to be negative K times the, say, vertical displacement. And that means K, in absolute value at least, which, well, okay, I'm thinking of K as positive when I write this force because the force is in the opposite direction as Y. The absolute value of K, which does equal K itself, K will be positive, will be the absolute value of the force divided by the displacement that absolute value when you actually attach it and it does the displacement then becomes 49 newtons divided by 0.1 meters, 490 newtons per meter. That's just some background, okay? And I am letting Y be the vertical position, the displacement of the match attached from equilibrium with a positive Y axis pointing upward, which might not be always the best choice, especially if you grab the mass and stretch it, you might wanna think of downward as positive, but that's not what I did here. Upward is positive. In the absence of any friction and air resistance, use Newton's second law and Hooke's law. This essentially is Hooke's law right here. Um, to write down a second order initial value problem for the position, the vertical displacement from equilibrium. The mass is stretched to a position 0.3 meters below equilibrium, a negative initial position, then let go from rest at time zero with zero initial velocity. Newton's second law is F equals MA. MA is the total force, which by Hooke's law, I'm assuming is negative KY. That's a differential equation in disguise because A, the acceleration, is the second derivative of Y with respect to time twice. So I can write this as M times the second derivative equals negative KY. And now I can plug in my M is five kilograms and my K is 490. I can write this as five times the second derivative equals negative 490 times y. That's one way to write the differential equation. I can also divide both sides by five. I could also write it with prime notation to save time. <laughs> y double prime, uh, negative 490 divided by five, what will that be, negative 98, I think? Yeah, without using my calculator. You can also write this in linear operator form, y double prime plus 98y equals zero. Any of these ways is okay. They're all fine ways of writing the second order differential equation. Initial position, careful, is negative 0.3. Units for position are meters here if I want everything to be consistent. And the initial velocity, which is y prime of zero, is zero because I'm letting it go from rest. So this entire three equations there, that's your IVP that solves the problem, okay? But again, the differential equation can also be written in these forms as well. It's fine, any one of those is okay. Careful about the initial position, negative because I'm taking y to be positive, and the initial position is below the equilibrium position. You might wonder, um, is it a problem making the equilibrium position be where the mass is after the spring is stretched and it's at rest? And the answer is yes, that's fine. All right, this problem here looks hard as you start reading it, but it's actually the easiest problem on this test, okay? Talking about vector fields ultimately and ultimately in phase planes, and that's gonna come up in this next problem, phase planes with some null clines. But we're thinking abstractly here. F is a two-dimensional vector field defined by this equation. You can think about vector fields without thinking about differential equations at all. You can draw a bunch of vectors based at various points x, y, whose first component is this and whose second component is, is this. You can plot a bunch of those. If you wanted to, that would be very time consuming. But this is more conceptual. Let this function, function of t as a parametric curve, be a solution of that differential equation. Suppose you happen to know y of 5 is also this. Now, use your imagination and pretend that this describes the motion of an object moving around the plane. In my lectures, 
for differential equations in linear algebra and also a pure differential equations course. I emphasize this a lot. Solution curves in a phase plane are parametric curves that move around that plane and therefore over time they have a position vector and a velocity vector. All right, what's the goal of the problem? What is the velocity vector at time five? Sounds impossible. How in the world are we going to do this? Well, remember, dy dt is the velocity vector of the solution at an arbitrary moment in time. And then if I plug in a particular moment in time, that will be a particular velocity vector for the solution curve. But the differential equation says at any moment in time, that equals the output of the vector field. I could write, this is not required in this problem, I could write capital Y vector prime of t equals boldface vector f of y of t for all t in the domain of y of t. That's what it means to solve this differential equation. In other words, the velocity vector at an arbitrary time is found by evaluating the vector field at y of t for that particular moment in time. So, we're talking about time 5 here. At time 5, I could write v of 5 is f of y of 5. But hey, f of y of 5 is f of this vector here, negative 2, 3. x is negative 2, y is 3. So we're at the point with coordinates, negative 2, 3. We're at about here. But what's f of negative 2, 3? I can just use the formula for the function. Replace x with negative 2, replace y with 3. 2 times negative 2 minus 3 times 3 squared. And then the second component is 5 times x to the fourth is 5 times negative 2 to the fourth. Now simplify. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. This is going to be minus 27. Negative 2 to the fourth is going to be positive 16. Right? Yep. Okay. Times 5. That will be 80. The final answer here is negative 3180. That will be the velocity vector for the solution curve at this point. That's going to be a very long vector in this picture. Uh, but yes, going up in that general direction here. Okay. I, I'm sure I didn't even draw it long enough. Okay. It would go off the paper. That would be the velocity vector. So the solution curve, as it moves around in the phase plane, if it comes to this point at that moment in time, it's going to have that velocity vector at that moment. It's going to be moving in that direction, tangent, tangential to the vector. And its speed, as a motion in the plane, will be the length of the vector, whatever that is. I'd have to take the square root of negative 31 squared plus 80 squared, OK, to figure out the speed. Pretty fast and pretty long. that's a pretty long vector. All right, but that is, when you know the concepts, that is the easiest problem. Eight, we got three more problems to do. Number eight, nine, and ten. Nine and ten uh, will, well, go maybe a little quicker. Consider a second order harmonic oscillator linear ODE. You could take, based on what you've learned from my student and lectures, the mass to be one effectively. K, the Hooke's law constant, the spring constant to be 2. And the 3 here in front of dy dt, which is the velocity, is related to the um, friction, okay, the damping. This is a damped harmonic oscillator. Letting v be the velocity, dy dt, leads to a first order linear system of two first order differential equations. Part A says to write down that corresponding first order linear system. Okay? That's fairly easy to do. The first equation of the system is the definition of v, written in the other way, dy dt equals v. The second differential equation is for dv dt, but dv dt, the derivative of the velocity, is the acceleration. That's a, that's dv dt right there. I could subtract 2y from both sides and subtract 3v. There's a v there to get negative 2y minus 3v. There's my system in as a first order scalar linear system. It is also possible to write it in vector form, which I'm thinking about in part b. If I let capital Y be 
a vector whose components are little y and little v, as I wrote here, except I explicitly put the of t's in there. Then in vector form, I could write this as dy dt, d vector y dt is a vector whose components are these things, v and negative 2y minus 3v. That's your vector field. I could think of that as a matrix times the vector yv. And the first row would be 0 and 1, so that the product of the first, dot product of the first row with this column would be 0y plus 1v is v. And the second row would be negative 2, negative 3. Dot product of this row with this column vector is negative 2y minus 3v, which matches this. OK, that's just some extra stuff. On to part b. Show work that confirms that this parametric curve solves the system from A. A um, few different ways we can do that. We could think about it component by component, or we could think of it in vector form. Let's go ahead and think about it component by component. Is dy dt equal to v? dy dt, we're doing part b here. For this function right here, negative e to the negative 2t plus e to the negative t is by the chain rule positive 2e to the negative 2t minus e to the negative t which matches v yes that does equal v for all t okay so it matches how about the other equation dv dt I need to differentiate this. I won't bother writing DDT of whatever's inside there. Differentiate this. Chain rule again. I get negative 4 e to the negative 2t. And then a plus e to the negative t. It's less clear that this works, but let's also simplify the right-hand side. Two, minus 2y minus 3v becomes minus 2 times, OK, maybe I should write this down y is negative e to the negative 2t plus e to the negative t minus 3v. v is 2e to the negative 2t minus e to the negative t. Hopefully this all simplifies down to the same thing as this. Distribute through positive 2e to the negative 2t minus 2e to the negative t minus 6e to the negative 2t plus 3e to the negative t. And when you combine the like terms, uh, these two terms give you minus 4e to the negative 2t from these two. And then these two give you plus e to the negative t, and we have a match. Okay, so it's fa the fact that these things match is what we were looking for, as well as dy dt, in fact, equaling v for all t. These two things imply that we do have a solution. Part C, graph y of t in a yv plane, a phase plane, say using your calculator to make a nice drawing. I'm going to go ahead and draw it without a calculator because um, I also want to emphasize the null clines and what's called an equilibrium point at the origin. I'll make the drawing, and you can check with your calculator that the parametric curve, this function here, really does show you what to do. You'd want to be in parametric mode in your calculator. Change the mode to parametric mode, par, and then in your y equals screen, you'd see things like this, and you could plug in the functions for x of t and y of t in there, and then make your graph. Okay? But I won't bother. I'll just make the drawing by hand. The phase plane is going to be a y v phase plane because those are the first and second components of capital boldface vector y. Um, what are the null clines? Let's think about those first. I have talked about those with my students at this point. Um, think about this system. The y null cline is where the right-hand side of the dy dt equation equals 0, where v equals 0, which is the y-axis. That's where v is 0. Because it's the y null cline, solution curves in the phase plane will cross that null cline vertically with 0 horizontal component because that's where dy dt is zero. So along the y-axis, solutions have to cross 
vertically, with vertical tangents, with velocity vectors that are vertical, pointing either straight up or straight down. What about the other null cline? The V null cline is where this is zero. Solving for V as a function of Y, that's a line with a slope of negative two thirds. And it goes to the origin as well. I'm solving for V as a function of Y. The slope is negative two thirds, something about like this, say. You gotta cross the V null cline horizontally. That's where dV dt is zero. Where distinct null clines cross, you get the equilibrium points, so that's at the origin. Now draw on this curve. If you plug in t equals zero, you get zero, negative one plus one, and two minus one is one. Zero one is the initial condition. And you can check with your calculator that the solution curve looks about like this. And the exponential decay in the formula does mean that the solution goes towards zero as t goes to infinity. You've got exponential decays. It actually never reaches the origin. It just approaches it asymptotically. Gets arbitrarily close. But we often draw it so that it touches the point there at the origin. But in reality, it never reaches the origin. Of course, a point at the origin is not really that big. <laughs> as this big purple dot, I'm just highlighting it by making it big. So that's the kind of thing you should see with the null clines. And I do want my students, you can use your calculator to help you draw it, but you should also think about the null clines and make sure you cross this one vertically right there with a vertical tangent and this one horizontally with a horizontal tangent right there. And I did not do a perfect job there, but got pretty close. Last page. This one is a mixing problem and Thank you, just set it up, but do not solve it, okay? We're setting up a, an initial value problem, but not solving it. Uh, that'll be a, a, definitely a blessing, because we'd have to use integrating factors again. For what values of t is the model, model valid? Okay, so we've got a tank. It's a 100 liter tank. 100 liter tank initially contains 20 liters of salt water. So effectively, it's fluid that's 20 liters of salt water, not pure water. It's got 30 grams total, and we're assuming the salt is well mixed. That's a background assumption in all these kinds of problems, is you, maybe you've got some turbines or something, blowers mixing up the salt water here. We're assuming it's well mixed, that its concentration is uniform, the same everywhere. Keeps things simple. We don't have to worry about facial, spatial effects when we do that. So there's 30 grams of salt, Q, Q of zero. Q is gonna be the uh, quantity of salt in, actually not pounds, but liters, that's a typo. Liters, T is time in minutes. Q of zero is going to be the 30 grams, okay? 30 grams, that's our initial condition. But what about the differential equation? Suppose salt water containing 10 grams of salt per liter is pumped into the top. So we got salt water coming in, 10 grams per liter. That's gonna be more concentrated than what we're starting with. 30 grams per 20 liters would be 1.5 grams per liter. So it's saltier water coming in the top at a rate of six liters per minute. The flow rate is six liters per minute and the concentration is 10 grams per liter. Water's all also going out. It's exiting the bottom of the tank at two liters per minute, well mixed salt water. And in fact, the salt, when it comes in, we're assuming it gets instantaneously well mixed because it keeps things simple. We don't have to think about spatial effects. If we were gonna think about spatial effects like diffusion, we'd have to think about a partial differential equation and we definitely don't wanna do that in this course at this point at least. The basic principle for the differential equation is that the rate of change of the quantity of salt is its rate in minus its rate out. That's the basic principle and you want the units to be units of Q, which are grams per unit of T, which is minutes. This is gonna be in grams per minute and thinking about the units helps you figure out the differential equation. The rate in is 60. 
grams per minute because you multiply the flow rate, 6 liters per minute, times the concentration, 10 grams per liter, the liters would cancel. Let me go ahead and write that out. 6 liters per minute times 10 gallon, uh, grams per liter. The liters will cancel, leaving you with 60 grams per minute. The rate out is the trickier part. The flow rate is given 2 liters per minute, but the concentration is not so easy to figure out. Concentration still is going to be in grams per liter. What's the number of liters? Think about the volume. It starts with 20 liters of volume and is growing by 6 minus 2, 4 liters every minute. 20 plus 4t has to be the volume, where this 4 is coming from 6 minus 2, and the 20 is coming from the initial volume at time 0. But what about the grams? It's not constant. And it's not a simple function of t. It's the unknown function q, which is a function of t, though I don't explicitly put the of t in there. So simplifying and including the initial condition, the final answer for the IVP is dq dt equals 60 minus, I could put a 2q over 20 plus 4t, or I can cancel this 2 with a 20 and a 4 to leave q over 10 plus 2t. q of 0 equals 30. There is the initial value problem that is the answer. How long is this model valid for? It's valid until the tank fills. And if, it, if you don't stop, then it's going to overflow and stuff happens. So uh, we want to assume we shut it off at that moment in time. But I need to set the volume 20 plus 4t from here. This is A here, this is B. Set that equal to the total uh, capacity of the tank, 100 liters, and solve for T. Subtract 20 from both sides, then divide both sides by 4. 20 minutes is the maximum value of T. So this model is valid for T between 0 and 20 minutes. OK? All right, here's the last problem, and save the best for last. It's a proof. Oh, boy. Let yp be a solution of this differential equation right there, and let yh be a solution of the corresponding homogeneous equation where the right-hand side is 0 right there. Prove with sentences that the sum is a solution of the differential equation, the original differential equation. This is not a full justification for why we add these two functions to get the general solution. It's a partial justification. It will be a solution, but the question is whether it's the most, most general solution. So how do you start? Um, there's various ways you could start. You could restate what's in the first sentence if you wanted to. That's a lot of words. Um, I'd probably say something like this. By our assumptions, anytime you do a proof, you have to use some assumptions you're making. The assumptions being yp is the solution of this and yh is the solution of this. Those are your assumptions. By our assumptions, I can write, let me go ahead and be a little bit more careful here and put the of t's in there. I wouldn't count it wrong for my students if you don't. But just for emphasis, y p prime of t, that's dy dt, plus g of t times y p of t equals r of t for all t in some appropriate domain. I'm not worrying about the domains. And y h solves this one, homogeneous. y h prime of t plus g of t times y h of t equals 0 for all t in some appropriate domain. That's what it means to solve those differential equations, yp solving this non-homogeneous equation and yh solving the corresponding homogeneous equation where the right-hand side is 0. That's needed. You need these facts. What's your goal? Your goal is to prove that the sum of these two solves 
the non-homogeneous equation. You got to use your assumptions. Do we need to use anything else? Yeah, the linearity of the derivative operator. Let me write it like this. Then, well, I'll go ahead and say that by, you could just say by linearity, I will be a bit more specific and say by linearity of the derivative operator, the d dt, you might say, or you could just call it a prime. I'll write d dt. d dt of, go ahead and write yp of t plus yh of t. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to show y p plus y h solves this differential equation. When I plug it into the left hand side, does it simplify to the right hand side for all t? Plus g of t times, yeah, I'll replace this y with y p of t plus y h of t. I'm also going to use the distributive property. Let's add that to the reasons here. when I distribute the g of t through the parentheses there. This equals, I haven't used the linearity and the distributive property yet, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. I can write y prime, yp prime of t plus yh prime of t. That's the linearity of the derivative. Here use the distributive property, g of t times yp of t plus g of t times y h of t. Um, therefore, rearranging, my goal is to try to use what I'm assuming. I need to rearrange. That's technically the commutative property. By the commutative property, addition is commutative. I can group the y p's together. I'll save a little time there. Yp prime of t plus g of t times yp of t. I'm using parentheses around this just for emphasis. Though if I do, I suppose you could say and the associative property. I'd be fine with my students if you just said algebra properties that we know. And group the yh terms together, yh prime of t plus g of t times yh of t. We haven't used these assumptions yet. Use them now. This whole thing by that equation is r of t. This whole thing by this equation is zero. This gives r of t for all t. And that does it. That proves, I'll use three dots for there for this time. Therefore, y equals yp plus yh, and now I'm suppressing the t's, but they are there in my mind, solves the original non-homogeneous equation. dy dt plus g of t y equals r of t. I've replaced the left-hand side with yp plus yh right here, and I see that it simplifies to the right-hand side r of t at the end for all t. That's what it means to solve this differential equation. So we're done. QED, PTL, praise the Lord. We're done. And that is also the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.